Hello there, this is Drums and Wires, Classic Tracks Reviewed. I'm Peter Cook and we have Steve Peer here. Now we, we resisted the obvious for so long now to do something about Bill Nelson's Red Noise, but Steve Peer is actually a credible witness because he was in the band playing live. So Steve, take us on from there. Well, are you ready to explore the Phantom Zone? Just about. Okay. Because the track we're going to look at today is A Better Home in the Phantom Zone. It's probably the, uh, well, it's clearly the longest track on the Sound on Sound album. Coming up somewhere like four and change. All the other ones are two, three minute long tracks. This one's the longest one. Kind of goes on the on, a, on quite a journey. And uh and we'll get back to that just in a second. I just want to point out that Sound on Sound album because it might be sort of a bold statement, but I really think that that Sound on Sound album, which incidentally I had very little to do with, that was Bill on the drums and Dave Maddox. So I'm not trying to toot my own horn because my horn wasn't on the record. Like you said, I did the tour and uh, did the beginning of what I would consider the second Red Noise album that never came to fruition. That's another story. However, I think that this album, and hopefully we'll get a lot of people disagree with me, really ended the classic rock era in 1979. I know that's a bold statement because you have ACDC uh, had a big album in 79. You had newcomers like The Clash and The Police. But I really believe that Sound on Sound just sort of stopped the classic rock Everything we knew about classic rock, whether it was like Cream to Leonard Skinner, it came to an end. And that album ushered in modern pop music, you know. I mean, and at the same time, you had, uh, you know, a band like Joy Division, for example, who was doing the same thing. And um, I, yeah, I just think it was the, the end of an era and the beginning of an era as an album. So now we get into A Better Home and The Phantom Zone. The lyrics alone are worth the price of admission. Like most of the record, the lyrics are just witty, uh, satirical. They really are kind of funny and kind of charming, even though Bill takes us down this very, uh, you know, dystopic road, which I think that sort of style and spirit and uh, vision influenced bands decades after Sound on Sound. You know, that that just, be, you know, take a more current band like Muse. I mean, they took pages out of Bebop Deluxe and out of Red Noise, clearly. So I just get a kick out of the Phantom Zone because it goes through a very hard rock sort of beginning, uh, a, a very intricate kind of crimson, crimson sort of middle. And, uh, you know, just takes you through several different genres within four minutes and 29 seconds. And it was a blast to play because it does have those intricate, uh, sorry, those intricate sort of, again, King Crimson sort of uh, band playing very tightly in unison, you know, and and I thought the Red Noise live band did a great job of that. So we were absolutely flawless, really, not to break my arm, patting myself on the back. Mm. So we, I, I should sort of intervene here and say, for those that have not encountered Red Noise or Bill Nelson, that prior to this album, Bill Nelson was playing fantastically perfect pop songs and um, being a restless sort of individual he, he decided he didn't want to continue to do that and this really um, was quite hard to take for his fan base and very hard to take for his record company wasn't it because they sort of parted the ways at this point because <laughs> record companies just want you to keep repeating what you did before really don't they at some at some level yeah I, I believe so I mean there was definitely some uh, people certainly didn't know how to take the album at the time. Mm. And, um, yeah, I, I, from what my recollection and even just doing sort of a quick review of some of the early reviews and stuff. Yeah, the, the critics were a little, little rough and some of the fans were even a little rough. And that's why I say in retrospect, fans you know, really caught on. And I, you know, sometimes I even read things to this day, they're sort of apologetic for not getting on board, you know? And, um, 
and and really looking back and saying, "Wow, I I missed that." You know that you know what was I thinking? Well, you were you were stuck in the, you know, the bebop era, and you didn't want to let it go. That's understandable. Anytime anybody makes a change like that, unless again, like you are David Bowie or a Prince, and people are looking forward to the next incarnation, it's hard. It really is. So I mean, in, in, you said this song is four minutes long, and most of them are two and a half minutes and three minutes. But he fitted, right. he fitted all the bits in, but he almost resisted playing the guitar on this album, didn't he? There are bits of guitar, and there is a bit on the Phantom Zone, but he really didn't do lengthy guitar solos, which had obviously characterised much of what he'd done before, this sort of, you know, sort of guitar hero thing. He just sort of said, I'm not doing that anymore, which is very arty, isn't it, for someone just to say, I'm sorry, but what you like, I'm leaving that behind and doing something else. And of course, this is the whole thing about music that people, some people successfully reinvent themselves and take their audiences with them. And sometimes the audience is sort of dragging behind a little bit. I think half of the audience it helped, really wanted more of what was there and they had to catch up over 10, 20, or maybe even 30 years. It's still, this album is still, uh, adored but also disputed because of this sudden cliff edge that he's jumped off and said I'm not doing the guitar thing anymore yeah and that's another reason uh, one of the many reasons and someday like I said we'll dissect my bold statement that this album signifies the end of classic rock I mean how, how what a bombastic statement but he really did you know, hammer a nail right, right through the heart of the guitar hero himself. I mean, he wasn't criticizing anybody else. I mean, my God, my goodness, you know, he, he, he loves the guitar and he, he continues to, you know, you know, take it as far as he possibly can. You know, he, he's like a Hendrix when it comes to the guitar. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it's not like he, he put it in the case and put it into a closet and never did it again, but he certainly was abandoning, as you say, the guitar, hero kind of wanking sort of a thing you know without a doubt and it's funny too when you know again i'm going to use the word you know in retrospect probably for the third time here now but it's just uh, I, I read a, a thing last july by a uh, a person post-punk monk from july 2020 a blogger or, or something like that you can look up his stuff post-punk monk i repeat it twice because he's a fabulous writer and he did a review of sound on sound um, again, like you said, you know, 30 years later, and I think he probably got it the first time around in 1979, but his, his review post punk monk third time is so spot on. It's, it's just incredible. I mean, the, the guy's got a way with words to begin with, and he, he just nails the whole thing. And, um, and I, anyway, I just think that's, that's worth a read. I probably should have read it before we got together again today, but, um, but you yeah. played on the live tour and you, you said, well, I didn't do the album, but uh, we talked talk about that before. But I mean, the set wasn't very long, was it? No, that's that's what's kind of funny, too. It's uh, I was just reading an article in The Guardian today, uh, this week, about how old rock stars can't go out on the road anymore. You know, Ozzy's got the Parkinson's, Madonna, you know, her bones are falling apart from dancing. You know, Prince, you even, we talked about last week, he needed painkillers for wearing high heels and jumping around. And uh, and, and I'm thinking, you can't do two and a half hour shows anymore. Our show was... 33 minutes long, I think, or 35 minutes long. I mean, it was, it was like running a sprint in a marathon. Uh, it was relentless. I don't even think we took a breath between the songs. I mean, we gave the Ramones a run for their money in regard to the, all we, the only thing we didn't do is count off the songs in German, you know, in advance of uh, the next tune. But it, it was a frenetic, uh, crazy crazy show i mean there's no question about it but it was a short show um and and also you got to remember too it might you might not have noticed in the audience but we were wearing these wool suits so we were losing 10 or 15 pounds each show as well so <laughs> we, we might put a picture up of those suits actually <laughs> but, uh, 
you know, the idea of drumming inside a sort of communist inspired wool, woolen suit is. Yeah, woolen suit. I mean, you know, at least we could have, uh, you know, had some kind of polyester or something or other, you, you know. But uh, anyway, the band was extremely well rehearsed and I, I matched the band up against anybody. Uh, there's no question about it. It was like, uh, you know, Bill was a very good taskmaster and made sure that everything was, you know, spot on and was right. And, um, and speaking about not being on any on the album, you know, which was, you know, a little, little heartbreaking maybe at the time. And, you know, looking back, what does it matter? <clears throat> but in rehearsal, speaking of the Ramones, we did uh, Art Empire Industry. I know we're straying a little bit from uh, A Better Home in the Phantom Zone, but I think we covered that. But uh, Art Empire Industry in rehearsals, um, we were playing it and I was like, hey, what would you guys think if we did a little sort of a, uh, you know, just a couple bars of like art, empire, industry, art, empire, industry. And Bill was like, yeah, that sounds pretty good. And we rehearsed it and we did it. And then it got on the album. So I, I, I take credit for 12 bars on that album of the art, empire, industry chant, plus using a police whistle at the end of that chant. If you listen closely on the headphones, you can hear a whistle. <laughs> So uh, that's my contribution. 12 bars of Ramon style drumming and a whistle. I hope this is not like a Aston family Barrett story of Bob Martin <laughs> where, where he had 54 children and he tried to suggest that the bass lines were more important than the songs and uh, because he needed the money for his kids. So yeah. because we do know that Bill's still waiting to be paid for those records. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I'm taking this as a sort of genuine thing rather than the sort of uh, seeking money for, you know, thousands of children right. that you haven't told us about. But anyway, one other thing that occurs to me. So, yes, you did the you did the tour, but then you, you went on with Bill into his sort of exploratory era, didn't you? You, wrote, you actually turned turn some songs out with him. I got all these special singles at the time and you were on some of those, I think, weren't you? Right. Not, not that I knew anything that was going on. I mean, even when I just read, uh, you know, Bill's discography, I read about Cocteau records and Polygram and Mercury and, and Harvest. And uh, it's like the business doings are, uh, just had to be mind boggling, but maybe that was just the way it was in the seventies and early eighties. But it just, uh, so I was just innocently going along thinking, okay, we're just going to be, we're recording ideal homes. We're recording disposable, instantly yours. You know, these things that came out on singles or EPs or years later on a, a compilation. And so, you know, I was just saying, well, we must be working on the second red noise album. <laughs> you know, little did I know that harvest records had no interest in the second red noise album. And, uh, but it, but anyway, you know, certainly we were probably halfway through an album, you know, recording something here, recording something there. I mean, there was this, and it's pretty easy to find, but boy, it'd be really nice if it got cleaned up a little bit. There's that 33, 35 minute live show recorded with the Rolling Stones mobile unit, you know, from, from one of the gigs or several of the gigs with John Leckie you know, producing it, you know, there, you know, outside of one of the halls sitting in the mobile unit. I mean, so there's a really cool collection of, uh, of the sound on sound album live, plus the bebop deluxe song possession, which again, I think I suggested, I believe Bill was nice enough to say, well, what, what would you like to do, Steve? Oh, I love, I love possession, but I really love new precision off drastic plastic. But I think that was a little, maybe too defining of Peabock, you know, possession really fit into the, uh, possession clearly was, you know, red noise kind of, kind of in the cooker, you know, really. Yeah. But, uh, so that. yeah, I thought there'd be a second, you know, red noise album coming out. Not that I had to be really a major part of it, but I just thought I could see the, the beginnings of one taking place for sure. And speaking of the live show, just really quickly, we had a great band with us on those, 13 or 14 dates that we did fingerprints from Scotland and uh, they, they were just a total blast and they were just a high energy kind of 
not, not a party band, that sounds kind of cheap, but they were just all about the fun and really got the younger crowd. I mean, we had a younger crowd at those Red Noise shows. You know, this is what this wasn't like geezers like me going to the show. There might have been a few, but there were just a lot of, you know, kind of punk kids, you know, going for the ride. Knew it was going to be something different. And fingerprints were just, you know, fantastic, kind of revving them up and getting them ready to get clobbered by us. So just wanted to get that in for the boys. Yeah. So here we have it then. Bill Nelson. Uh, he started on Drastic Plastic doing Red Noise songs, but nobody nobody noticed that. But when he did Red Noise, it was a huge sort of change. And then, of course, the record company thought, well, you know, half the fans have gone. Um, and so that started his solo career. But uh, what I, I mean, that album has definitely influenced so many bands since then. I, I hear it in all sorts of places, as you mentioned. Uh, so really, um, this is the trouble with being ahead of your time. But Bill is an artist rather than a performing monkey, isn't he, really? Yeah, yeah. As we've talked about privately, you know, he, he truly is an artist. Um, not someone like me, I'm like still 12 years old. I just like beat on the drums and mess around and, and have a good time. And, and uh, you know, once in a while, think about being an artist. And I say, ah, gosh, who am I kidding? You're just a drummer. And, uh, but, but Bill really is. And, uh, and, and, uh, you know, he's, he's got the, the, the following to, to prove it too. I mean, the, the loyalty and everything is phenomenal. And in case yeah. people are thinking, well, we've got to get the red noise album and everything, all his output ever since that isn't the same either, but people who are listening to this must go to billnelson.com and find out what he's doing now. And it's a complete world apart from, from all of that as well. And he occasionally surprises us with a throwback to the 50s, to Dwayne Eddy, and sometimes he throws us forward, sideways, backwards, and all sorts of things. But uh, yeah, BillNelson.com is the place to go. And check the Red Noise album out. And yeah, yes, yes. And you know, I got a little special treat for you to wrap things up. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got this poster behind me here, which, okay, you can see it's I, I ripped it off the wall and I've since framed it and it's in my little rock and roll, uh, you know, Hall of Fame museum, but I brought it down for this special occasion here. And what was the ticket price on this thing? Oh my gosh. That was like three pounds or something. <laughs> Pretty amazing. But as a little perk, you know, or we had, we had red noise tour jackets. Yes. And I, I think, well, okay, Katina, I'm going to just have, Katina, show you the back of this, because this thing, this is what we should have wore on stage. This would not have been nearly as hot. So why don't you take a seat? Just take a, uh, take, uh, take a walk across the back there. Yeah, let's see. I'll, I'll kind of guide you in, because I want you to see the, the logo. And I stand up a little bit. Bill Nelson's Red Noise right there, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I think I wore it like three times. Uh, I'll put it on eBay tomorrow. And <laughs> no. No. Thanks, Katina. <laughs> keep it, keep it. Fantastic. I'll keep it. Yeah, if I gave it to anyone, it'd probably be you. Uh, all I've got is a, a awesome. There you go. Thing. Come on. <laughs> all I can do here is just sort of sign us out and go. <laughs> and the guitar is out of tune. So I can't do any more of that. Ideal homes. Yeah. It, yeah. It, we, yeah. This has been. Um, Drums and Wires, where if, you, yep. if you've got things you want to tell us more about this or you know better than we do, then we'd love to hear from you and uh, suggest what we'd like, to, what you'd like to hear us review next. And we don't tend to go for mainstream tracks. We tend to do the things that uh, are interesting. So Drums and Wires, Steve Peer, thank you very much. <laughs>